Good morning. I'm Police Chief Katrina Thompson. And on behalf of the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department, I welcome you to the May 2020 Public Safety News Conference. As you all know, May and this week in particular marks National Police Week. On Police Officer Memorial Day and during Police Week, we commend the brave women and men of law enforcement and the law enforcement community for continually summoning the courage to fulfill their solemn oath to protect and to serve. We also pause to remember all those who've lost their lives and who has suffered permanent disabilities defending their countries, their communities, and the rule of law, including the heroes who we have lost this year to coronavirus. Due to the international COVID-19 pandemic, we are not able to publicly celebrate our brave women and men in law enforcement or recognize our brave officers who's paid the ultimate sacrifice, but our gratitude still remains. As is customary, I ask that you join me in honoring our fallen officers for the months of April and May who paid the ultimate sacrifice to the Winston-Salem community. Senior Officer Bobby F. Dean. End of watch, Friday, April 23rd, 1993. Officer Bean was shot and killed while serving a search warrant for drugs. The suspect, a 38-year-old male, was found guilty of first-degree murder on November 12, 1993, and was sentenced to life in prison. Senior Officer Bean was with the agency for 15 years at the time of his death and was survived by his wife and children. Patrolman Michael M. Vickers. End of watch, Sunday, May 19, 1895. Patrolman Vickers was shot and killed by a young man, 19 years of age, during an altercation on a street while he was on patrol. The altercation started when the suspect was asked by Patrolman H.H. H. Dean, who was the patrolman uh, who was patrolling with Vickers, to move off the sidewalk to let a woman pass. He resisted the request. The suspect was angry because another police officer had just been acquitted of a murder of his brother a year earlier. A fight followed when Patrolman Dean removed the suspect from the sidewalk. Patrolman Dean tried to search him for a pistol, but the suspect resisted. The suspect swung at Patrolman Vickers, knocking him to the ground. Patrolman Dean defended his fellow officer by, in turn, knocking the suspect to the ground. When the suspect rose, he came up with a pistol in hand and shot Patrolman Vickers in the neck and stomach. Patrolman Vickers died the next day. The suspect was convic convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor our fallen officers and all our first responders across our nation who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Before I begin with upcoming events, I'd like to thank the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department for their relentless time, effort, and brave sacrifices in risking their lives every day for the great work that they do and for this community. Your work is not unnoticed. Upcoming events, as mentioned earlier, May 10th through May 16th, 2020, is National Police Week. Since coronavirus, officers throughout the city 
has been helping with mass, the Mask the City program initiated by the mayor. Also, Community Resource Unit continues to help with Meals on Wheels delivery throughout our community. Up next, we will have Assistant Police Chief W.S. Weaver, who will talk about de deployment status. He will be followed by Winston-Salem Police Sergeant Varon Chu from our recruiting unit to talk about recruitment opportunities. And finally, Detective Mark Barker will talk about fraud safety tips. Assistant Chief Weaver. Good morning, Winston-Salem, and thank you for tuning in this morning to our public safety news conference. I am W.S. Weaver II, Assistant Police Chief over the Patrol and Special Operations Divisions of your Winston-Salem Police Department. I'm here this morning to provide an operational status update of the WSPD during this international pandemic. As a professional law enforcement agency, we're making the appropriate adaptations and adjustments to continue our operations throughout the COVID-19 challenges. We want to ensure our residents and our businesses that we remain fully functional, regardless of the challenge as you expect. As an example that we've taken from retired four-star general Stanley McChrystal, we're following his recommendation of adopting a model of digital leadership. Under this model, the WSPD has to operate from distributed positions utilizing digital technology because we're working in the field, we're working from WSPD facilities, and important aspects of the WSPD are working from home. We have to use digital conferencing as we're accomplishing with this press conference now because we are geographically dispersed, but we still have a professional law enforcement agency to continue operating. While operating in this manner, we're aware that cybersecurity attacks have increased against governments including malicious acts against municipalities in North Carolina. As more of our employees are working from home, we're ensuring that our employees maintain cybersecurity protocols for both their work and home computer networks. The city of Winston-Salem government has a robust cybersecurity training program for all city employees that utilize the city computer network. Our cybersecurity training program includes random employee testing for protocol violations. This training helps our governmental networks remain secure. Our North Carolina executive order expired on May 8th, and at this time, we're in phase one of the governor's plan to return to business in North Carolina. WSPD staffing remains strong based on our normal staffing amounts. We've had a few officers out with childcare or other family challenges but we have been very fortunate. Only one of our police officers has tested positive for COVID-19. Our department has been and continues to basically operate as we have before the pandemic. As we look at our statistics of what's been occurring in our city, our part one crimes, and those crimes are homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, motor vehicle theft, larceny, and arson. When we compare February before the executive order lockdown to April, which is during the lockdown, it, our overall crime rate has been down about 3%. When we combine our part one crimes with our part two crimes, and those are the less serious crimes, such as simple assaults, forgery, fraud, narcotics violations, et cetera, our overall crime is down about 9%. With our part one crimes, burglary is down 16% and larcenies are down 15%. However, as you saw this past weekend, gun violence continues to be a problem in our community with aggravated assaults being up 54% when you compare February 2020 to April 2020. Keep in mind that this is a national trend during the pandemic with law enforcement agencies across our country experiencing needed, needless gun violence. I'd also like to add that based on our individual incident investigations, it appears that there is an at least an acquaintance relationship between the shooter and their victim. These are not random shootings of citizens. 
Additionally, as you saw in our press release two weeks ago regarding juveniles stealing cars from auto dealerships, our auto thefts are up 36% when we compare February to April. WSPD has started to begin preparations for the next wave of COVID-19, whether it strikes within months following return to business within our state or whether it strikes this fall. We're anticipating that the wave this fall may have more illnesses and deaths than what we've already experienced because the fall wave of COVID-19 will coincide with the flu season. Keep in mind that flu kills 30 to 40,000 people in the United States every year and with two simultaneous respiratory outbreaks occurring this fall, our healthcare system will be stressed more than we've already experienced. Therefore, we're encouraging our personnel for the next year to 18 months to maintain social distance, wash their hands, use sanitizer, wear a mask, and strongly consider taking the influenza vaccination offered by the city for city employees this fall. We're receiving needed supplies. We've had orders placed and received through both city and state emergency management, the city of Winston-Salem warehouse, PPE suppliers in our Piedmont triad, and we've purchased supplies through retailers to keep our employees safe. We appreciate all that you have done in the city to support our public safety first responder community, which includes the fire service, emergency medical, emergency management, and law enforcement during these challenging times. From the law enforcement perspective, we've had support and love shown to us through verbal and written comments, handmade and commercial mask deliveries, officer, officers of hand sanitizers and food. And on Saturday, May 2nd, we had chicken minis, pizza, and one of our community law, and law firms provided lunch for us. So much food has been offered to the WSPD by citizens and businesses that we've had to caution our personnel against overeating. With the nature and types of problems that we see, cautioning our personnel against overeating is a good problem to have. This past Monday evening, we advised the City Council Public Safety Committee of an allocation that we have received from the federal government. As part of the Federal Government's CARES Act, that's Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, passed by Congress to assist with the response to the novel coronavirus pandemic. The United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, made available supplemental funding for coronavirus. The city of Winston-Salem's allocated amount is over $523,000 and it's permitted only for law enforcement and criminal justice purposes. The Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program, those funds can only be used for purposes related to preventing, preparing for, and responding to the coronavirus challenges. The Winston-Salem Police Department proposes to use this $523,000 to cover expenses related to buying laptop computers. Those computers will be issued new issued to our personnel for use in their patrol cars. Additionally, we're looking at the Lexus Nexus desk officer reporting system. That desk officer reporting system is an application that will allow non-emergency inbound calls to be routed to the application, which provides individuals with instant access to WSPD customized non-emergency incident reporting website. Our community members will have the ability to file reports, give crime tips, and other incidents through our secure online reporting system. That system supports multiple languages, and it will be a tremendous benefit for the non-English speaking citizens and visitors to Winston-Salem. These services can be provided without the need for face-to-face -face contact, and that'll reduce the risk of community spread to both our officers and from our officers. As this application comes online, we will appropriately advertise it. We will expressly state that this system will not be utilized for emergencies. Calling 911 will remain the primary procedure for handling emergencies. The Street Smart application. Street Smart application will provide real time data to keep our employees informed, 
and provide them with essential facts about incidents and crime patterns that will be in a specific geographic area. Street Smart will provide up to the minute data feeds, maps, bulletins, and case management tools to our officers that are in the patrol cars. Keep in mind that for the last 18 years, Winston-Salem City Government has been named a top 10 digital city for our country, for cities of our size, for the use of digital technology. Both the LexisNexis Dex Officer Reporting System and the Street Smart application will demonstrate the WSPD commitment to continuing to be part of a top 10 digital city. We'll also utilize some of those funds for personal protective equipment that includes N95 masks, hand sanitizer, latex gloves, biohazard response kits, disinfectant sprays, and disinfectant wipes. And the last part of our funding will be utilized for our civil disobedience response team. Civil disobedience has posed major safety risks to the civilians, government employees, and also law enforcement. Whether that's through the threat of physical violence or simply through exposure to infectious disease because of being in large crowds. Our civil disobedience response team looks to replace some outdated equipment. It also, that in equipment includes ride shields, barricades, gloves, flex cuffs, helmets, shin and arm protectors, gas masks, and gas mask carriers. We at the WSPD are in conference calls with emergency management and public health twice per week, and we keep our personnel advised of discovered trends as needed at both the statewide and Forsyth County level. As an example, a few weeks ago, Forsyth County Public Health Director Josh Swift said that 45% of Forsyth County confirmed COVID-19 cases were people under 45 years old. 32% were 46 to 64 years old, and 23% were over 65 years old. So our younger population is at risk and has the ability to place our older population at risk. With a multi-generational workforce, we at WSPD want our younger employees to understand that they are susceptible to COVID-19 and to be careful around their parents, their older neighbors, and experienced officers like myself. Forsyth County is the fourth largest county in North Carolina at just over 382,000 population, and we have been fortunate. Maintaining social distance to mitigate community spread has worked and we continue to emphasize that to our personnel. I hope that by providing this information to the, uh, about the WSPD, it continues to increase our resident and business confidence in your police department. We're out here 24 seven to serve and protect. Please call us as you need us. I'm honored to be serving with the WSPD, TV, WSPD team and to be serving my hometown community. Thank you to the residents of Winston-Salem and our WSPD PD team for all that you have done, are doing, and will do to help our continual navigation of this international crisis. Next up will be Sergeant Baron Chu. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Veron Chu, that's V-E-R-R-O-N-C-H-U-E, and I'm the current sergeant over the recruiting unit for the police department. I'd just like to take a few minutes this morning to update everyone on the status for our next Basic Law Enforcement Training Academy, BLET, Class 76. During the current health crisis, our ability to offer testing has slowed down just a bit, yet we are indeed hiring for that upcoming academy, uh, and we're testing and processing applications. We have a tentative start date for that class for the fall of this year in October. And as of 5-11 of this year, our recent allocation numbers uh, indicate to us that we are 61 police officers short and applicants for our academies are our way to continuously decrease that number. We still accept lateral and 
pre-certified applications as well. The difference between the two is that a lateral uh, officer has worked for a police department for two years uh, with a minimum of those two years being on a patrol-based function like we do for our uh, department uh, in patrol-based functions. Pre-certified applicants are those applicants that possess a current law enforcement cert certification through the state of North Carolina. However, they have yet to have a job with an agency. Out-of-state uh, pre-certified officers will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and here's some of the information on our, our slide about the, the upcoming class. Uh, I'll go over the initial steps for the reading comprehension test uh, after I go over the state mandated uh, minimum standards for uh, the state of North Carolina. So the minimum uh, standards for the state are that you must be a U.S. citizen. You must be a U.S. citizen, be at least 20 years of age upon entering the academy. You have good moral character, having no felony, serious misdemeanor, or driving while impaired convictions within the past five years. You must be in good physical condition, must possess or be able to obtain a North Carolina driver's license. Out-of-state applicants must obtain a North Carolina driver's license in compliance with state laws, and we give you time to, to get a North Carolina driver's license. And you must possess, at the very minimum, a high school diploma or a high school equivalency, equivalency diploma, formerly known as your GED. The initial step of the application process is the same. Uh, it's our reading comprehension test, and it is now being offered several times a week or by appointment. I'll cover, after I've just covered the minimum standards, uh, those next testing days are May 15th, which is this Friday, May 26th, and May 28th at 9 a.m. on all three of those days. The instructions for those signing up for those uh, testing dates are as follows. You go to our website, wsbd.org and click the apply tab. Once you click the apply tab, the link and the scheduled testing link uh, to follow, you'll successfully sign up and you'll know you signed up because you'll receive a confirmation email based on the email that you provided to that sign up system. On the day of your testing, please bring your driver's license. Uh, that way we can verify that it was you that indeed signed up for the testing day. All testing days have a limited seating in order to comply with social distancing and safety protocols. If you cannot make the testing date, please go back online, remove your name so that somebody else can have an opportunity to take the test. And if you can't make it, you must call us so that we can reschedule you in order you to, for you to take your test. Do not just show up to our office. We will not be able to allow you in. We cannot accept walk-ins at this time for testing dates. Uh, and it's only by signing up or appointment. In addition to hiring for our next BLT Academy, we still have scholarship opportunities available. Our two are the App State Scholarship and our HBCU Scholarship. These two programs are virtually the same with the exception of the majors that you have to uh, specify when you go to the school. For App State, you have to be a criminal justice major. For HBCU, you can major in uh, whatever field you like. It's essentially you go through the same hiring process as if you're gonna be a police officer and once you meet all those standards and application protocols, you can be accepted into the program. Our next program is the cadet program, and this program is primarily for individuals who are too young to join our police academy fresh out of high school. So we will put them through a two year school um, with the same application process as the other two scholarships and hiring them to, if they're going to become a police officer. And the, the now benefit is that this uh, cadet program has now been expanded from not just for Titan Tech Community College, but to Davidson County. Guilford Tech, Rockingham, and Surrey Community Colleges. So if you have somebody that's interested, that's uh, one of those schools is their neighboring school, please have them reach out to us and sign up, sign up and we'll get to them. Any questions uh, for the recruiting unit, please reach out to us by email or by phone number uh, and we'll answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your time and attention this morning and uh, continue to be safe. Next up will be Detective Barker. Good morning. I'm Detective Mark Barker with the Criminal Investigations Division Financial Crimes Unit. I'd like to talk to you for a second about uh, some fraudulent schemes in general. The 
citizens and, and nationally, people are exposed to different schemes and frauds. Some of you may have received phone calls. Um, you may or may not answer those phone calls where people are trying to get information from you. Um, obviously, during this time, the majority of people are either working from home part-time, full-time working from home, or staying at home trying to social distance. With that being said, everybody knows that everyone's staying at home, so do the scammers. So you may get phone calls or a uptick in phone calls um, where they're trying to uh, essentially fish your information. In other words, they're trying to get your information, your personal information, social security numbers, date of birth, all that sensitive information that we've been told to keep very sensitive and, and very private. Um, recently, the IRS has uh, extended the tax deadline. Typically by now, the majority of citizens have already filed their taxes, but they now have until July 15th to do that. With that also comes the potential for fraud. The IRS is not gonna contact you and ask you for your social security number or to confirm your social security number, your birth date, or that other information. This year, we also received a stimulus. Some people are still in that process of receiving the stimulus, um, and they may receive phone calls, again, people pretending to be the IRS, who are obviously not the IRS, trying to get that personal identifying information. Um, there are also various different scams that, that we see nationally and have seen a few locally um, to the event of, or the effect of, um, package scams. Essentially, a person will contact saying they're some form of a loved one trying to receive money. The best prevention for most of these frauds is to verify, contact, talk to somebody that you know, whoever they might be pretending to be, a loved one, relative, whoever, and verify that that is who they say they are. It may look like it's coming from a phone number that's your relative, but there are various ways to make it look like that's the relative phone number uh, when it's truly someone else just trying to scam them. Um, nationally, we've seen um, just in general, fraud investigators throughout the nation have seen an uptick because people are staying at home in phishing emails, um, whether that be work or personal emails, again, trying to get that personal identifying information, um, as well as business email compromises. It may look like an email coming from uh, your boss or, you know, payroll asking to change an account number or asking to, again, to verify some kind of social security number for clerical purposes. Um, and it may look like an official email, but as you look closer into it, it may be a variation of that email. And again, what they're trying to do is they're trying to either get your personal information. If it's an accounting issue, they may be trying to get your bank information. Um, with that, obviously, opens up your bank account to the potential for fraud. Um, again, nationally, we have also seen uh, charity and fundraising fraud uh, in relation to the pandemic. Um, obviously, the majority of people would, would love to help out, and sometimes you may feel like you're helping out, but in reality, you may be helping further a scam. So trust um, some of those larger, you know, charities that we deal with, or even the local ones. If, if it's a church that you're involved with, speak with that church member. Don't just go off of a phone call and, and try to send money that way or give out personal information, bank account information, things like that. Um, the best, again, like I said before, the best prevention for the majority of these frauds is communication. Talk with a loved one. If you've been a victim of a scam or feel you've been a victim of a scam, Call your local law enforcement. Speak with your family about these things. Communicate in general with the public, whether you're a member of a church or another organization, and get the information out there on how it happens. Sometimes it can be embarrassing if we fall victim to the scam, but if we can prevent someone else, a family member, a loved one, a church member, whoever, from having that same interaction with that person on the phone, that's gonna be the best prevention that we have against fraud. Um, Feel free to check out the Consumer Protection Division of the uh, Department of Justice, North Carolina Department of Justice. That's the North Carolina DOJ, so ncdoj.gov. Um, there is also the Federal Trade Commission has various um, information out there for consumers who either feel they're the victim of a fraud or want more information on fraud. And of course, the Winston-Salem Police Department, we have our own website as well. Um, 
again, if, if you feel like you've been the victim of a fraud or are concerned that maybe some of your information has gotten out um, accidentally or through one of these phishing phone calls or emails, please contact local law enforcement um, and you know, report it to us so we can take a look at it and help the citizens. Uh, next up will be Chief Thompson. At this time, we will take questions um, on any of the information that has been presented. As we see that there are no questions, um, we want to remind you that the next public safety news conference will be held on July 8th. 2020 at 10 a.m. We also want to remind you that we want you to stay healthy. We want you to stay safe. If possible, please stay home. If you must leave your resident, please wear a mask, maintain social distancing of at least six feet, and wash your hands as often as possible with soap and water or use hand sanitizer. Thank you, Winston-Salem and Forsyth County. Stay safe. 